Welcome to Jinja Templating. My name is Christopher and I will be your guide. This course is all about the Jinja 2 library with a splash of its use inside of Flask. You'll learn about Jinja 2 templates, how they substitute values, what template tags are, how to modify data with filters, writing inclusion macros, and just enough Flask to play with Jinja 2 templates and HTML. Code in this course was tested using Python 3.11, Jinja 2 3.1, and Flask 2.3. Jinja 2 is a template processing toolkit, which allows you to create text-based templates with content value placeholders, which are then rendered into a result. Within a template, you can substitute variables, perform control flow like conditionals and looping, and compose and combine templates so you can organize your templates like you organize your code. Flask is a web application framework and Jinja 2 integrates with it quite well, where the templating is commonly used to manage your HTML output. Let's dive into Jinja 2 and write a template. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll show you how to write a Jinja 2 template. Jinja 2 is a text-based templating system. Through it, you can populate and render a template using variable replacement, tags, including conditionals, looping, inheritance and inclusion, and function like macros. And you can also modify variable data on the fly using filters. Jinja 2 is a third-party library and as such is installed using pip. As always, best practice here is to use a virtual environment. Note that the reason I keep saying Jinja 2 rather than just Jinja is there is a Jinja, but it's legacy. If you attempt to pip install Jinja without the 2, you'll get an error in Python 3. Trust me, I found that out the hard way. Once you've got it installed, head into the REPL to create your first template. First off, you need to import the library. Don't forget the 2. Everything in Jinja is done through an environment. Later, this object is used to configure how templates are sourced, but for now, the default is fine. The fromString method on the environment creates a template object from a string, logically enough. The double braces here indicate a variable substitution. When rendered, the template's context contains a dictionary with key value pairs. Any key named in double braces is replaced by its corresponding value. The double braces are sometimes known as mustache braces. Now that you have a template, you render it using the render method, passing in any context variables that can be used to turn the template into a result. And there you go. That's your first template. The value of name has been replaced with world, and the most famous string in programming is your result. As you've seen, templates are based on strings, but a far more common way of getting a template is to load them from a file rather than hard coding them in your program. This is where that environment thing comes in. When you construct an environment, you can tell it to load templates from a directory. Let's go into the REPL and play with this. Suppose you were teaching a course on Python and you wanted to send a customized message to the students who did well on a recent test. Templates allow you to do this using a concept similar to a mail merge in word processing tools. This program loads a template, loops through the student data, and outputs a result file for each student containing the message to be sent. If you were doing this for real, you might also have it email the message, but I'll skip that. This chunk near the top is the data that is to be used in the template. It includes the name of the test, the max score, and a list of dictionaries with the results for the top students. Here, like in the example before, I'm creating an environment. This time though, I'm passing in the file system loader. This loader takes the name of a directory as configuration and all future template loads will be based on files in that directory. With the environment set up, next it's time to load a template. Mine is called good.txt. 
I'll show you the contents of that in just a minute. With the template in place, it is now time to render it for each student. First off, I create a file name for the output. Next, I do the actual rendering. Notice what I'm passing in here. It's the dictionary for the specific student that I'm creating a message for, as well as the max score and test name. This forms the context for the template, and when the template is rendered, the values corresponding here can be used inside of it. Now that I've called render and put it in content, all that is left is to write the result to a file. So here I open a file, and there I write the content. At the end, just so that you know what's going on, I print out a message to the screen saying that I've done this. Now let's take a look at good.txt, the template that gets used by this program. At the top of the file here, you see brace sharp or hash, or pound, whatever you want to call that symbol. That's the template engine's comment character. So this first line is just a comment telling you what the file is. The next line is the greeting. It uses the mustache braces you saw in the previous example to write the student's name. Remember when render was called? That method took the student dictionary and some keyword arguments for the max score and test name. Render wants key value pairs for everything and treats the dictionary as a grouping of them. So there's no student object, just the key value pairs from inside the student dictionary injected directly into the context. This next line has the test name, and this one has the score from the student dictionary and the max score value that was passed in as a keyword argument. All right, back to the code. And now I'll run it all on the command line. And there are the three messages having been created. Let's look at one of the files. This is the message for Willow, and you can see how her name and her score, along with the max score and test name, have been replaced inside of the resulting file. You can do more than just variable substitution. You can manage the flow of content in a template with tags. And that's what's in the next lesson. In the previous lesson, I introduced you to rendering templates. In this lesson, I'll be talking about conditional blocks and looping through them using template tags. Tags are denoted by brace percent. And they're kind of like keywords in Python. The first tag I'm going to show you is the conditional, built using if, and if, and an optional else clause. Let's go construct a template using this tag. I've modified the student message program from the previous lesson just a little bit. This time, the message will go to both students who did well and those who did poorly. The first change is to add some extra student data. The second change is I'm loading a different template. Instead of good.txt, this time I'm loading all.txt. Pretty much everything else is the same. So let's go look at all.txt. This template uses tags. This if tag does a comparison of the value for score against 80. If it evaluates to true, then the block between here and the else is what gets rendered. If it evaluates to false, then the block between the else and the end if tag is what gets rendered instead. It's pretty much the template version of Python's if else blocks. Let me just run this. Here's the result for Willow, same as before. And here's the note for Xander. Hopefully, he'll do better next time. Tags can also be used for looping, allowing you to reuse a section of template repeatedly. This program uses the same data as before, but instead of creating messages for the students, it creates a single CSV file exporting the data. The template this time is called export.csv. 
And seeing as there's only a single output file this time, its file name has been hard-coded. Instead of passing named values into the render function, here I'm using a context dictionary. This pattern is quite common, and you'll see it in a lot of templating libraries. In fact, when you get to rendering HTML in Flask, this is pretty much the only way to do it. Like before, I open a file for writing. This time, I'm calling render with the context dictionary and writing it out all in one line. Let's look at the export CSV template. That's a bit hard to read, isn't it? Unfortunately, it has to be. The white space and the new lines in this file are important. If you put a space between the for tag and the student value, you'd get a space in the resulting export file. Likewise, as this is a CSV file, all the values have to be on the same line with the new line at the end. What you put in the template forms the actual output. If you had put the end for tag on the same line as above, your resulting file would all be in a single line. Later, when I show you HTML, none of this will matter because HTML ignores spaces. But for a CSV file, this is important. Sneakily, I've run the program in the background. Let's look at the results. And there you go, a CSV export of the student's marks. Next up, a quick intro to the Flask web application framework. In the previous lesson, I showed you template tags. In this lesson, I'll introduce Flask, the web application framework. You are still watching a Jinja 2 templating course. And this may seem like a bit of a right turn, but web pages are a very common use case for templating. Jinja 2 gets used in both Flask and Django to manage HTML pages. Django also has its own templating language, which uses most of the same symbols and a lot of the same tags and filters. Because this use case is so common, the rest of this course uses HTML as examples. Flask is a web application framework that makes it pretty quick to create web pages. Pairing the right decorator with a short function gives you a web page. Both Flask and Jinja2 are part of the Palettes project and being maintained by the same group of people. It isn't surprising then that they work closely together. As Flask is a third party library, you'll need to pip install to use it. This 11 line program is a website. Pretty wild, huh? Flask calls its programs apps and the main program tends to be named app.py. The first thing your Flask app needs is to import Flask, and then you instantiate an app object. You can instantiate multiple apps, and to differentiate them, you name them. Similar to how logging works, common practice is to name it after the file it is in, so you don't have to worry about whether your name is unique. The route decorator is what turns a function into a web view. A view is responsible for outputting content for a page. The argument to route is the relative URL for this page. Sticking with my hello world theme, this is the slash hello slash route. After that, it's pretty much just a function. You return a string from the function, and Flask takes care of turning that into HTTP content for your browser. Flask includes a development server that you use while you're building and testing your website. If you haven't seen the Dunder name trick before, this checks if the file is being run directly, as opposed to being loaded as a module. If it is being run directly, then the run method on the app turns on the development server. Passing in debug equals true turns on some debugging features. I pretty much won't be using them, but it's common practice and who am I to flaunt that? Okay, now to the command line. I run the app.py as a script, and this launches the development server. You can see here that it has output the host and port that it is listening to, which defaults to port 5000. Let's go to a web browser and visit this host with the slash hello relative URL. There's the URL, and that's the resulting page. Nothing terribly dramatic, but it is kind of exciting how little code it took to get a web server going. 
That's the beauty of Flask. Let's go back to app.py and write another view, this time using a Jinja 2 template, because that's what you're here for. I've added a new view to the app.py file. The key difference here between home and hello is I've used Flask's render template method. It takes the name of a template, which it expects to be in a directory named templates, and keyword arguments to be used as the context for the template. Note that as this is going to be for the home page, the route is just a lonely old slash. And here's the template, which I've named base.html. I've done this on purpose rather than home.html, and I'll explain more about that in the next lesson. This file is pretty much just an HTML page with a single variable that's going to get rendered. I've added a new tag here for future use. The block tag is used to note a chunk that can be replaced later. For now, don't worry about it. In this situation, it does nothing. I'll come back to it in the next lesson. My dev server is still running in the background. In fact, you can leave it running. It automatically detects changes to the app.py file and reloads as necessary. So let's go take a look at the output. There's the URL. And here's the page. Still nothing dramatic, but now it's prettier because it is actually HTML instead of plain text. And of course, variable substitution still works, so title got replaced with Jenny's server. HTML is rather repetitive. Wouldn't it be great if you could organize it the way you do with functions and classes in Python? Spoiler alert, you can. Next up, template inheritance.